Kiitos. Tak. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Heraclitus said that no man ever steps in the same river twice. On those who step in the same rivers, different and different waters flow. You can guess that this is about change. Heraclitus also suggested that the world and its various parts are kept together <coughs> through the tension produced by the unity of opposites, uh, like the string of a bow or a lyre. Um, so this is a river illustrating some change. This is, uh, this is called Neris in my hometown in Vilnius. Times are of change, and I come from computer science. Machine learning, where a change in the context surrounding the learning tasks is known as concept drift. That's the key word for, for the subfield. Pandemics, wars, economic turbulences, or climate disasters change the way people work. Uh, it changes the way people go about daily routines. Um, a few weeks into the recent pandemic, a major airline had to discard over 200 statistical models predicting passenger flows. That case I, I know quite from, from direct uh, discussion with people involved. So basically the pandemics came and uh, then the models just didn't work anymore. Human analysts stepped uh, to make predictions fully manual, at least for a while. At the same time, and this is also a real case I know of, uh, at the same time in another part of the world, a city hospital had to suspend models used to predict occupancy of beds. Uh, so basically for obvious reasons they didn't work anymore. These two real examples represent a lot of similar cases around the world where patterns learned in pre-pandemic uh, world largely went out of tune at least for a while. And this can happen for data-driven predictive models, this can happen for process-based models, or this can even uh, the same way happen for decision-making that is manual, that uh, models are in people's heads. The models are approximations of reality. They are summaries, and they include what is relevant. They don't include everything. Um, concept drift research in machine learning rapidly gained attention over the last decades when it became clear that practical machine learning applications or predictive modeling applications rarely satisfy the classical assumptions of independently and identically distributed data, basically data that stays the same over time. This uh, assumption traditionally has been used for performance guarantees for robustness and quantifying uncertainty of modeling. So um, adaptive modeling came into field. The pandemic is an extreme change. It's a state shift, if you will, at least for a while again. But at smaller scales, uh, concept drift is omnipresent in analytical applications. Uh, street constructions can change traffic flows this we can see almost uh, these days, what is happening in Hakaniemi. So traffic flows can change. Travel time predictions can go out of tune. Economic turbulences can change uh, the situation of credit risks of people. Um, and then uh, drive credit scoring models out of tune, for instance. Adversaries invent new ways of network intrusions or how to spam and then how to overcome spam filters intrusion detection models fail. At smaller scales, changes happen continuously and they gradually drive at least some of predictive rules of any complexity out of tune. And again, whether they are learned manually or statistically or otherwise. And again, because our models are, are approximations. And from the analytical reasoning and decision-making perspective, we would like to understand how to adapt and how to keep computational uh, how, how to keep the analytical reasoning, uh, either computational or otherwise, robust, resilient, and reliable. So that's the line of research that I do on the, on the computational side. Even more so, we want to understand how the world changes, what processes make it change, and to what extent those processes are universal over time, over space, and across systems in nature and society. So I also research quite a lot on change itself and how the world changes and how the world, world works. 
And a lot of my current research focuses on understanding change processes in complex systems, especially in the living systems, and in nature, its evolution. Uh, and in nature and society, systems are never at equilibrium, arguably. Yet, uh, deterministic-like patterns of rise and decline are surprisingly common, for instance, in biological attacks over millions of years. So we can ask why some entities exist longer than others, how they rise and decline, and what of those processes can and cannot be predicted in principle. So not only how we make computational models sort of hands-on, but also what, what is predictable and what is not is, is of interest to me. Um, this is uh, Nishiyama Onsen Keiyukan Hotel in Japan that was con continuously operating for around 1,300 years. It was uh, held by 52 generations of the same family until in year 2017, so pre-pandemic, when no family members were willing to take over the business, the, the company was dissolved, discontinued. Uh, a hotel operates in the same building today under a new company and new ownership. It's still a hotel, but the, the entity was dissolved. Statistics tells us that the average lifespan of a company, at least in the US, is about 10 years. So then we can wonder how come that this particular one existed for so long, what's so special, and why, why did it dissolve? And are patterns of this happening common in any way and comparable across different systems, both in, in, in biology and in society and, and broadly? What, what are the mechanisms that make this happen? Um, the simplest trajectory of an entity over time, uh, depicted here, can be as, uh, seen as a hat pattern. On the horizontal axis, we have time uh, of existence. It can be species, it can be a business, it can be um, even a music genre. Uh, so in biology, we, we usually uh, talk about uh, yeah, entities like, like species in this context, but uh, it, it's quite, quite a generic uh, uh, pattern overall. So the horizontal is, is time of existence and the vertical is how abundant or widespread it is. And so we have uh, basically five main, main points. So emergence of an entity, say of a species or a taxa. We have dissolution or extinction at the end. And then at some point between these two points, uh, the entity rises and declines. There is a peak somewhere and there can be multiple peaks. In model peaks are quite common, but not necessarily uh, universal. And Yes, so with this simple, simple trajectory, so it's, uh, patterns like that are quite common across different systems. And here are six examples, uh, not, not plotted in the, same, uh, in the same framework, but basically representing the same, the same thing, so pattern of rise and decline. Uh, examples from the fossil taxa in mammals, popularity of music genre over time, share prices, prevalence of microbial communities in uh, guts of, of the hosts, abundance of firms in pulp and paper industry in Sweden, and the territories of the Ottoman empires over time. So the territories are there in color, uh, like at which places, at which times they held, how many, how many territories they held. So fundamentally, those patterns of rise and decline, like hat patterns, they can be modeled as a, a sigmoid growth, familiar to many perhaps. Um, so some sort of innovation, and this is in competitive systems, so some sort of innovation happens at the beginning, uh, and when there are so few individuals holding that innovation or that advantage, then they outcompete resources from others as if the resources were infinite. So this is as if the growth would be almost exponential, very fast growth at the beginning when some sort of innovation or advantage happens. So in species it can be traits, in companies it can be a routine, and uh, uh, otherwise. And so when this continues, when the uh, entity species or entity grows, slowly the competition against others turns into competition against self or individuals of the same, similar, similar ones, having, um, having the same uh, advantage or innovation. And this happens through inheritance, because, uh, like assuming that this uh, trait or advantage or routine can be carried forward, inherited. 
And so when the competition against others turn against similar of self, then this is where the S-curve bends. Uh, and this continues until the initial advantage uh, gets interrupted uh, by the next advantage. And this can happen in any time. And the key to this happening in any, at any time is because there is inheritance, so uh, the next ones do not need to start from scratch. So they build on what has already been built. And so this new innovation and interruption can happen any time. And so when this happens, then this uh, uh, rise turns into a decline. And then the two, uh, two parts of the S-curve make, make the head pattern. And of course, it can have multiple peaks, but the single peak is, is relatively common in, in the systems. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so the two halves of, of a sigmoid make a hat pattern, and if we look at the simulation, so this is, this is a simulation of a syst competitive system like that with uh, biological taxa species in mind, but it also can apply to other systems. This is what happens. So we get uh, advantages of various magnitudes acquired at random at different times, giving rise to new species or new entities. Uh, and interestingly, it can be demonstrated that the height and the duration can be independent of each other. There can be abundant and short-lived species. There can be rare and long-lived, or anything in between. There can be abundant and long-lived. Uh, and for lasting, lo so one of, one of the interesting parts of that is that for, having, for lasting long, being big is not necessary. So, so like one doesn't have to be large in order to be long-lived long, long uh, lived in terms of entities. Uh, in macroevolution, this relates to the law of constant extinction formulated by Lee Van Valen in the picture here in the 70s, where uh, the, the statement uh, was that the probability of extinction within the same ecological context does not depend on species age. Um, so in a competitive system like this, uh, the lifespan of entities can be modeled as an exponential decay, which is also used for modeling breakdowns, uh, for, for modeling um, unstable isotope. isotopes, for example, uh, decay, radiocarbon decay. It, uh, it can also be modeled, uh, uh, used for modeling durations of phone calls and failures of mechanical systems. And one thing in common between those systems and so exponential decay models in principle uh, is that enti entities in those competitive systems are exposed to many independent trials uh, again and again. And so this stop and this new innovation can happen at any time because the trials repeat again and again. So we can even, like we think of species, so that would be competition uh, against, against others. We can think of mechanical systems that would be sort of mechanical system operating so so a breakdown can can happen because it independently of, of the previous one in this case um, yeah and in macroevolution this process is explained and modeled uh, as the red queen's hypothesis illustrated here uh, so the red queen from Lewis uh, a metaphor from Lewis Carroll's uh, Carroll's uh, books where the Red Queen uh, said to Alice that uh, one, one has to run faster than one can in order to overcome, overcome the system. So that's my paraphrasing because I happen not to have the quote directly written in my note. Uh, and what I skipped was um, uh, examples from the mammalian, uh, mammalian fossil record over uh, through this Cenozoic, through tens of millions of years. Uh, coming out as uh, linear patterns in these survivorship curves, like depicted here. So basically, this means that uh, this this illustrates that uh, the the probability of uh, extinction in the record is similar at different ages. So for long and short-lived species, the probability of extinction at one time is similar, and this is because they are exposed to uh, new and new trials <coughs> again and again. And we see that this is quite common in, in different systems, uh, yeah, in, in the society as well, in, in economic systems, uh, civilizations recently, we recently looked, looked as well. So quite curious and interesting. Um, so 
dissolution can be terminal, so when something goes extinct or dissolves or disappears, it can be terminal, but more often than not, while parts are replaced or individuals come and go, the identity and the defining characteristics of a system carry forward until it becomes something else. So becoming something else, so dissolution or, or termination of the pattern doesn't mean that it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, this is uh, sort of a sad, sad thing, but it can be it can be other ways and it can be becoming something else. And so when adaptation happens, then uh, that something else carries new name, but it carries forward the characteristics that have been learned or uh, build up through many, many previous um, entities. Like a new river here. So thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. <coughs> we have uh, time for several questions, discussions, comments. Any? Then off. You, you, you have been very general. All of your, your, your uh, slopes uh, could be illustrated from recent history here. Of course, the Nokia mobile phone is, is, uh, is something that we never forget here in, in Finland. Just mm -hmm. everything yeah. was going well, and it was just exponentially growing. And then one day, one year, the iPhone arrived. And that was the end. And just a few years after that, it was all gone. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, this is a very good, very good and interesting point. And actually, I use uh, Nokia example sometimes in in talks in relation to identity being carried forward because they they also did the rubber boots uh, at the and then the phones and then the masts. So these are now different companies carrying the same identity. And so when people sometimes ask what's in common between systems that are long lived, so that is one thing that can be in common that somehow they change into different things, but they carry, carry onwards. And uh, Nokia is a very interesting example of that. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Uh, may I? Ah, uh, Pauline. Yes, thank you. Just a kind of general question uh, from someone who doesn't know so much about this. I was actually curious, what kind of areas do you mostly uh, cooperate with when you, I mean, as you, you come from computer science, but apparently mm -hmm. there are many different areas that you work with. Yeah, uh, mostly, nowadays mostly uh, biology, paleontology and bio biological systems. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we, I, I also, we have a project that is interdisciplinary and uh, connects uh, at least six areas, including uh, paleontology, microbial ecology, musicology, uh, industry history, uh, and cities, trans uh, transportation evolution, so that's one. But mostly like 80-90% it's paleontology nowadays for, for, the, uh, for the sort of research. Thank you. Anything else? May I ask you, <coughs> when will the human species come to that peak and uh, start to decline? <laughs> What's your prediction, <laughs> uh, your computer model <laughs> prediction? This is not the first time I get this question and I usually <laughs> um, not a, don't answer. <laughs> So I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> OK, thank you. It's, it's certainly a difficult answer, uh, dif difficult question. And when it happens, it will be difficult for many. OK, is there anything else? If not, let's thank Indra once more. Thank you.